And our final uh, presenter, before we move to a discussion, is Dr. Peter Cohen. Dr. Cohen has been the medical director for Maryland's Alcohol and Drug Abuse Administration. That's good uh, and enough. has, for over 17 years, has uh, been a medical director in county and state governments concerning substance abuse and will speak to us on development of clinical guidelines. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep to the time here. Uh, I, I was always taught by my first, and this is by my first psychotherapy teacher, to always pay attention to the obvious. And the first obvious is that statue over there. Now, I tried to see if there was a name, but this person is probably in deep thought, but that's not what I think. I think this person mimics what's going on in the room, which is something which is called conference cognitive disorder <laughs> or, or seminar brain where after a while your mouth is open, you look like my Uncle Max when he was sleeping. All right? So take a look at that if you start to drift off. The second is I look at this, I, as I take a look around and I, I take a look at all these pictures around here and I'm reminded of Harry Potter, some of you are Harry Potter fans, that they might be talking to us. <laughs> and some of them are saying, move on, move on. Let me give you a little advice but it has said something about Philadelphia too, because these gentlemen, and they were all gentlemen, unfortunately they were all gentlemen, but they were, um, tried a lot of things out in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia, if you didn't know, in terms of putting on a show, was one of the instrumental places where you put on a show before you went on to the Broadway, okay? And when I was a student here at Penn, that's my tie, uh, I actually went to see Helen Hayes Maybe it was maybe about a year before she died. I needed to see Helen Hayes. She was trying out a show. I was going to do that. Well, we're trying out a show here. So that's the second. But you know, so when you think about what some of the things they tried out here, such as how are we going to get rid of malaria in Philadelphia because all the founding fathers are hightailing it out of town in the middle of the summer, and we better get this um, Declaration of Independence done by July 4th because otherwise we're going to get malaria. All right? That's one. Whipple procedures. Um, uh, one procedure after another. I'm sure they were discussing things like this, and they're sitting here saying, what's this about uh, opiates and benzos? He says, and this, this fellow over here is giving a little advice. He says, listen, what worked in our time is leeches, laudanum, and bloodletting. <laughs> All right? Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe bloodletting a little bit, or leeches, actually, still have a place. So. This is it. So what we're really doing and what I'm discussing here, whoa, is can we get some help? Can we get some help here? We need to put on a show. And Philadelphia is a place that traditionally is a place where you're putting on a show. And I'm using that as a, uh, as a metaphor. But I don't have any crowd pleasing closer, you know, the rollicking number like from chorus line one. Um, uh, or, or some other great number, Oklahoma, something along those lines, or Wheels of a Dream, if you know, uh, Ragtime, something like that that gets everybody on their feet. Uh, I want to get you out of here. And I also am not stating that what we're doing here, which is um, uh, what Pete Luongo reminded me at one time about the, the late, great Lauren Mosier, was he said a lot of times we all get together in task force to learn how to plan to plan, right? No, we're not going to do that. We, we really have some work to do. I, I do want to thank uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Luongo and Dr. Lindsay for inviting me here. Dr. Luongo took uh, the risk twice to hire me, and I hung around enough, which is another one of my themes, enough to learn a couple things. One of them is, is I think we know what we got to do. That's not the problem. It's could we stop planning it? And the second is have predictable processes because we're all going to be on that wall someday. Maybe if, we're, maybe if we're lucky or unlucky. But, but we're going to be in that wall. We're not going to be around, but we have to leave a legacy and something that can't be torn down. And that's another thing that I've, that I've learned, and I learned from Dr. Longer. You've got to construct some things that don't get torn down. It's just not enough to say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll fly by the seat of our pants, and heaven knows we're doing our best. So so these are, I've got three questions. I decided not on four because it's not the Passover Seder. I stuck to three. Um, but these are, are, well, the guidelines out here, what do they include and what's missing? And I want to spend more time with the what's missing. Um, yeah, there are guidelines. There they are. Southeast Asia 
has guidelines around benzodiazepine treatment in people who are opioid dependent. Da da, our work is done. And it's translated in English, too. But you'll see that there are a number of them, and those are included. If you take a look at those, I even included in there a compilation of all of these. But what I want to show you is some of the main trends that you'll see. But notice at the bottom, there's no current online CMEs, but a half a year ago there was. If you really wanted to learn more and even get some CEUs or CMEs about benzos and opioid maintenance treatment, you can't get it any longer. Uh, so we know that's one thing we need to do is provide some of that education like we're doing today. All right. Here's what some of these guidelines in Q. Uh, just take a look at this. The obvious. But this is a template for what I'm urging, thanks to Dr. Taylor who kept goading me on, but I agree with her anyway. We, we need to create guidelines, but I want to say how I like to look at guidelines. But these are some of the obvious. This is what these guidelines have already written. We don't need to do a certain amount of work. They've thought about this. Even general rules, I call them both uh, practices and maxims, um, and, and warnings and advices, but, but, but they're already in there what we've been talking about today. And by the way, I saw one person back here who's taken copious notes and is taking copious notes. You right over there? Where did you go? Where did you? No, there you. Whoever you are and you know who you are, you're going to be writing these because you've written everything down we need to know here. All right? And here's what the guidelines include. All right? Other things. What to do when they're withdrawing. What to do while they're abusing. Principles of withdrawal everything you've been talking about, it's all there. For all of you who are very compulsive and need to read all these, I'm sorry I can't help you, read faster. <laughs> um, but, but moving through here, you can see all of this is just laid out. This is what you want to take a look at, including what if they're using other multiple substances? What about psychiatric factors? All of this, include this in guidelines for people. And I'll say what, what I think of guidelines in a, in a minute. But first, what's missing? And this is what I want to get to, the heart of the matter here. We need, I, I do think it helps to have some agreements, and that's what these guidelines don't state. Guidelines really are so medically focused, maybe a little bit of psychotherapeutically focused, but mostly medically focused. But how many people in the room here you're not non-medical, which mean that you could also be deceased. How many of you are not medically trained or trained and otherwise trained? Right, right. The guidelines have to be for all of us, and not just not the medical. And, and, and I mean it. We're talking about people who do the counseling, who do the treatment, who do the therapy. I'm preaching to the choir, yes, and administrators. That's what our guidelines have to be. It's a for the whole, because it's not just, well, if we tweak this and we tweak that, as we all know, the person will get better. They aren't. And this is what I get to. There are patient-physician agreements, and I've seen this in the, I had to give a talk on pain management. And in pain management, this is now being used. Not a contract, but an agreement with someone who's in exquisite pain, may have long-term pain, and needs help. And someone has already created the template out there for how it's, it's really text dependent. I'm not sure I could sit through the whole thing. But something that, that you have an agreement between you and the person you're helping to say, here's, what's gonna, here's what could happen, not here's what will happen. And if you don't behave and if you're a bad patient, I'm going to do this to you. But that it allows for something. It allows for uh, that kind of alliance that you need. And I, and I say that's one thing to include when you're thinking about guidelines. But also there's this there's an attitudinal, clinical, uh, and systemic component about this population. And it has to do with, are we going to put in this guidelines? Are we trying to retain people within a system of care if we're going to give guidelines? Or are we trying to discharge them when rules are broken? In other words, are, we gonna, is this, are these guidelines written at our convenience for time, how much time we have, how many pressures we have, how much we have to do, or is it going to be according to what the patient's needs are. Um, then, is it, none of them include, what are the standards for determining the proper level of care? That's an obvious. We agree. Well, we ought to start maybe with ASAM. If not, that there's several others. But that needs to be included, and I thought that that was missing. 
referral procedures. How are you going to do this? In expert studies, what, what they found, and John Knight is one of the persons that developed expert for screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. It's a big thing, paying lots of money. There's grants out there to do this work. But, but the biggest hang-up for the clinician is trying to refer the person and doing it in, in an easy way and getting them to the next level of care and having that warm handoff and thinking about what are your... So if you get someone who's out of control, wild and wooly, who's doing benzos, and, but, but yet they're staying on opioids, but they're not doing well, how, what's your procedure for referring? And having a standard and something predictable, when you leave the institution, everyone buys into it. And finally, there's got to be some planning, and I would urge this in the guideline. How are you going to shift, make this shift? Because people, as you know, I'm not going to give you a lecture about change and you want to change. Um, which is what my wife tells me every day. Um, but, but, but what you have here is, is we're, there's going to be an onslaught of referrals when this happens. How are we going to prepare for that? How are we going to prepare for that when we send someone on or to another level of care? We've got to prepare for that and think that through. What are your policies and procedures? How easy is it going to be? How, how quick is it going to be? And, and what about the unintended for consequences, obviously? And I do think that some mention of NIATEX ought to be put in here, that if we're going to do this, to think through what could you, what are the kind of questions you would ask if you had a NIATEX process, because you know NIATEX, which, what's the process you're going to do to be able to create some immediate quality improvement within your organization? That's the essence of the talk, but I wanted to add a few things. Um, which are in listening today. One is what, what was mentioned before, which were the B personalities. I remember in personality disorders, there was wild, weird, and, and um, there was one other, which I can't remember, just like Rick Perry. But um, <laughs> worried, thank you. Whew. Man, I was really worried about it. Um, it's the why, what they say, the wild, well, they're looking at narcissistic disorders, and, and borderline personalities and antisocial personalities. I hate them. We, we have to help our colleagues. If this is indeed what, I, forgive me who had pointed this out, really took to, to, to my brain, which was that we really need to do better with that population knowing how to manage persons who don't really thank us for the care we give them and are somewhat insulted by it at times. And, uh, experience narcissistic impulse, uh, narcissistic insults. Um, the, the person with a, learning, with a learning disability or has poor executive functioning, they don't stop and think before they act, and they don't have to have ADHD to do that. Actually, the, the slide, I can stay blank. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. You're dismissed, thank you. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I face every day individuals who um, need to learn how to calm um, and um, need to make good choices and are constantly fighting for self-respect. And that's just starting with my grandchildren. <laughs> but I say that seriously because this is the population and persons that we are dealing with on, on a regular basis. And, and one person that came to mind for me is someone who I've struck up a friendship with is Barbara Gordon. Some of you may know she wrote a book called I'm Dancing As Fast As I Can, which appears to be what all of us are doing. But she is still alive, and she is someone who severely had a severe reaction to getting off of Valium. She didn't have an opiate addiction. Uh, her book has is, is now been republished. Very moving account. And, and in speaking to her and the travail she went through and how well she is doing today, but the courage in her book of talking about the very ugly sides of herself and the courage she had to face up to herself when she got off of Valium and the courage to face up to herself when she wanted to not join the club of the rest of us bozos on the bus who experience anxiety every day and know that we actually, it's part of our system and we need it to warn us and because we're always thinking something might be happening right around the corner. 
but this is someone who at first didn't want to buy into that. But this journey and this courage that she took to become a well-balanced person is so important, and I remember that. This is something that clinical guidelines can't get you, but it's the heart and spirit of what's behind the clinical guidelines that we're working, that we're working with people. Um, and we are dancing as fast as we can, trying to help them. So here's the last parts that I say that are so important when you're, when you're trying to develop that are the most, uh, again, going back to the most obvious things. One is the treatment plan. I can't tell you how much and how important that is. The number of times that I've had to cite as the State Opioid Treatment Authority programs that simply didn't have a treatment plan about persons who are opiate dependent on and taking methadone on benzos. Just one little step. The second is, as I noticed it in programs, that you, you can have your, your guideline, but as, as David McDuff, who's one of the smartest psychiatrists I know around, said, he said, the best programs I saw had a culture of learning. And they had a culture of learning around subjects. And this is one of them, that everyone is learning this. Um, and so you don't develop an institutional intolerance towards the most difficult people. Um, you have predictable processes that are written down. And the, so what this document is, is a script. It's a script for the show. The rest of it is improvisational theater, where we're taking the best of our elements and figuring out what to do from person to person. But we've got that reference guide to take a look at to say, OK, and uh, what did Dr. K say? Oh, yeah, 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 that was really good. That was really helpful. I love, yeah, I'm going to use that. Um, and the last part is, is that, that I say that these, these are as good as we allow people to hang out and hang out around our program, where they've got a place to hang out. They know they can be there. They can be safe, just like we're doing here. We're hanging out together. We're trying to learn from us because we tend to think that there are, there's always someone smarter than us here who can teach us something and that we can do a heck of a lot better than what we're doing. And if we expect that of ourselves and we do that for ourselves and, and even some of our friends on the wall are still hanging out, we can expect that for people who are asking uh, for help. So I'm really willing and able to want to put down in writing what we've said here today in terms of clinical guidelines and you've got it there as your script when you're doing the hardest work you can. And all I can say after that is on with the show. Thank you. Is there any plans to have structured clinical trials of using benzodiazepines on very selective patients in a methadone program? Sure. I, I, I would say it, it, for, for a program to take a look at that and have the courage to take a look at that and say, uh, to, 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 for comparative studies to say, take a, by the way, this was done when in, in a pain management uh, program that they had a second, sort of a second chance element for persons that really were bombing out on the first one. And otherwise would be rejected by a lot of places, say, look, we'll, we'll take a look at you and see, see what we can do to help pull you together. I'll count to 10, and if we have no questions by then, we know that that, that was good enough. I uh, oh, just you made it. You know, in, uh, in dealing with benzos in the programs, there's a couple aspects of benzo management that we haven't put on the agenda. The first is, um, this week, as one of the directors, I got my pharmacy report, and about 20% of the names on the pharmacy report were people that are testing clean and sober, but yet are getting 90 and 120 uh, benzos a month. So the question is, what do you do with that? Um, second thing is uh, in analyzing critical incidents and in programs, behavioral incidents, um, it's my belief that the vast majority of them are either uh, directly or indirectly related to benzos. First of all, almost all the money disputes are benzo related. Uh, much of the relationship problems that we see that results in behaviors that make it very difficult for programs to manage. And those things, too, need guidelines on how to handle. I mean, we try to, I think all of us try and retain the patients as much as we can before you put them out. But when they're in your program, you know, selling benzos, 
um, you know, it makes it, uh, they're hurting other people. Yes. And, you know, quite frankly, as we develop the recovery, you know, environments, you know, directors get complaints about having, you know, environments where drugs are being sold and being offered and they affect the program in many different ways. So I think as we think about guidelines, we ought to be including, you know, those behavioral aspects as well. You know, today's session has primarily been about the effects of benzos as, you know, the physical effects and the medical effects. But there's behavioral effects. And I think tied into that on the, uh, on the I guess, the, the benzo environment we see at programs, much of it is economic. And uh, people are, and that's why I was interested in the idea of really using incentives you know, <laughs> if people are buying benzos, you know, to be able to make money, I, I wonder if there, you know, if, if there's not an alternative there somewhere that wouldn't be too uh, disadvantaged for us. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if you were speaking about incent incentives other than the incentive to come on in and I'll give you more benzos you can sell, but Maxine Stitzer has done some very interesting work with cocaine addicted persons um, in giving incentives to come on back and, and uh, increasing retention and treatment that, that I think is worth looking at. And, and I, I think your other points are well, your other point was well, one was well taken around what do we do about persons who are selling and all that. Um, I don't know if there are any other comments uh, from anyone. One more, and then one more. methadone-assisted treatment, as well as maybe some maintenance benzodiazepine use. And we had several uh, presenters who talked about that somewhat. At the same time, institutionally around the table, I feel a lot of anxiety on the part of programs and, um, and prescribers about that. That, you know, that sense of when the guidelines come out and there's enormous, uh, you know, uh, agreement around what safe practices are, that we can both model and uh, reassure each other with, uh, and and give a sa and can say a consistent message to the folks we're treating. That'll be great, but that we're not there yet. And I wondered what other people's senses were. Thank thank you for that. To to carry on with an analogy that I did, I I would imagine the same feeling happened when we were faced with malaria in, in Philadelphia and weren't exactly sure what to do. And part of me feels that way. But I think we know enough, uh, I, myself, my opinion is, is I want guidelines, but I also want to have a, f a field of the guidelines that have a systemic element to it in, in, a, in, addition, to, in addition to that. 